Um, I'm going to talk to you today about liberating legacy, which is an interesting subject for me, as you're going to find out because of what I've been doing for the last five or six years. Um, I love this quote, choose well, your choice is brief and yet endless. Um, I made a choice about six years ago for myself and my agency to get involved in something which, when we got involved in it, felt endless and sometimes very, very difficult. You may recall uh, last summer, um, UK put on a little sporting event. A few billion people watched it, what have you. Now, we won the Olympic Games based on a promise to deliver a legacy. I don't think any of us realised that the legacy we were trying to deliver would end up delivering a load of different legacies. And that's kind of my point today, is we start somewhere, we want to create something, and yet here it goes off in a different direction because people get involved. Um, this was the day we won it. This was London celebrating the fact that we had trounced Paris. And what was really interesting about that was, if anybody remembers it, all of the journalists were positioned in front of the Paris team because everybody was so convinced that Paris was going to get it. There were three journalists in front of the London team. And the brilliance of that was, at that moment, the Olympic Committee made a break with tradition and they embraced the future in a way that they'd probably never done before because this was a legacy about future. That was the next day in London. Massive bomb, 50-odd people dead. Both, weirdly, legacies. They're not going to be forgotten. They have an impact, and they're going to create echoes down history that we will all remember. And they're positive and they're negative. And while we were doing the Olympics, there were always the positive and the negative. When you are working on an Olympic committee, your whole life is taken up with column inches, how, how much is good and how much is bad. And when we started with um, the data, we basically had a situation where we had to take a nation of people who thought we were going to fuck it up to it not being OK. That was, that, was, that was what success looked like, from not fucking it up to it being OK. We didn't have any idea that it was going to be the success that it was or leave the legacies that it did. So while this is all going on, there's um, also a personal journey going on because you can't get involved with something at that scale that has that sort of impact on millions of people or meet the type of people that you meet during the Olympics and particularly the Paralympics um, and not be moved and motivated to look at your own life and go, what is my legacy? What am I leaving behind? What am I doing? And I work in advertising, you know, that bastion of legacy um, industry, you know, that is probably its biggest legacy is the Smash Martian. So you can kind of see where this is going. It starts to get to the point where you, you question your own fundamental kind of role in the world and start giving yourself a bit of a slap around the face. But that's, that's the kind of subtext that goes on. You know, legacy, what does it mean for the now is really what's important. You know, yes, it's about the past. Yes, it's about the future. But what's going to happen now? What do I do now? And as my good friend, uh, Charlie Hugh-Jones, who's a fellow pioneer, Pioneers is the company we've set up after the Olympics, every minute we live in the present is a minute of equity for the future. And I love that idea, that everything I do now, I am building equity for the future. However, you need to be really strong and you need to be really kind of critical of yourself to understand what your minute in the present is doing and building. And I wasn't feeling too comfortable with mine, so I thought about thinking about it differently. The other thing the Olympics um, and Paralympics did for us, I think, as well, was redefine legacy for a highly social world. You know, it's amazing. 342,000 tweets a day was the number when Beijing had the Olympics. You can imagine what we were dealing with four years later. The progress was ridiculous, and we had to rethink a lot of things. And the brilliant thing about that was there was also this other big thing that happened during our time delivering the Olympics, and that was that massive crash thing that happened where we all lost loads of money and nobody had any jobs, and it was a bit horrible for a while. And we had to suddenly rethink the whole way we were going to deliver the Olympics because we didn't have any money. So a highly social world needs to think differently. We, knew, we talk a lot in business about return on investment. I put money in, I get something back. Normally, more money. And that's the whole relationship. I think that's a really, really tired legacy of a capitalist economy that's really, really broken. And I don't understand it. I don't understand why what you put in is what you get out, and it has to be the same. What if you put something in and you got something out that was completely different? That would be quite interesting. What if we changed our ROI model? So that actually what we put in and what we get out is different. And I like to think of ROI in a modern world and with modern business about return on involvement. And I think that was one of the things I learned massively 
working with our partners on the Olympics, was those companies who wanted to really get involved and deliver something got so much more out of it than those that just paid for the, the rights to put their logo on the end of a piece of communication. It was amazing. So people like BT, who put a lot of effort into the Paralympics, got so much out of it as a corporation for their people inside their business that it just changed their whole way of thinking about sponsorship, which is brilliant. So that was one legacy that we, we sort of took out of it. And I think as well, true legacy should be measured in uh, units of human involvement because ultimately what we're trying to do is change behaviour at scale. We've got a lot of problems in the world. There are a lot of issues, the way we're behaving, the way that we're using resources, the way that our children are growing up to die younger than us. These are, these are the big questions that we need to understand and how do we change them. And therefore, legacies that are about personal aggrandisement and about making ourselves feel better, I'm not entirely sure I understand that. The only reason why you should do any legacy issue is to change behaviour for the positive. And I think that was something that came through massively in our games makers. Games makers are a really interesting thing. They make the games, and one of the things that's interesting about games makers is we wanted to redefine volunteering. We wanted to leave a legacy about volunteering that young people could get involved in and take part in. And it wasn't just my mum and the WI that did volunteering. You could actually be 17, quite groovy, and be a volunteer and call them a games maker, and it makes it all much better. So I think legacy really has to have an act of liberation in order to create that disruption. You have to do something. You have to be very active. You have to create a moment when you let it go, when you say it's not going to be the same. I mean, I, I don't know. I think throwing the Queen out of a helicopter was quite a uh, liberating act, <laughs> quite a brave one, maybe quite a dangerous one. But you get my drift. It's about doing stuff that mixes it up and makes people stop for a minute and go, does it have to be like that or can it be like something different? Superhumans, again, disrupting how we think about disability in this country. You know, we were working very closely with the Paralympians, and they are amazing, not because they're disabled, <laughs> weirdly, but because they are amazing athletes. I mean, I don't know how many of you have actually gone to a wheelchair basketball match, but bloody hell, it is noisy, it is dangerous, it's exciting, it's sweaty, it's incredible, it's the most incredible athletics I think I've ever seen and reframing people and reframing the way they think by calling our Paralympians superhumans all of a sudden the bar was raised and para Olympians are equal it's nothing to do with paraplegics it's to do with the equality para is equal to the Olympics and I think that didn't just make them equal it pushed them right over the edge Danny Boyle's act of liberation was this and um, I was monitoring social media uh, data as it came through and we had a very neutral response it was very neutral all the way through the first bit of the opening ceremony when it was quite quiet and then do you remember when the uh, chimneys came up phallic very phallic but apparently that just sent the whole twitter sphere absolutely mental within three seconds we were at 97 percent approval rate and that was danny boyle's storytelling which was just extraordinary i mean it was an extraordinary moment where what danny did was he said you think your legacy about being British is this, it's not, it's this. And you're in charge of it, and it's yours, own it and make it happen. I don't think Danny actually thought that his legacy would be his ability to turn a vitriolic press weirdly positive for six weeks. I mean, look, this is our press, by the way, this comes from our papers who were absolutely slamming people for six months beforehand. The real consequence of the games, if they continue on this golden path, will be more psychological than monetary or even sporting. I mean, whoa, where did that come from? It was amazing. And that was a legacy. To make us believe that we could be positive about our future and we could take it forward is an amazing gift to have been given. But the most important thing is Made in Britain suddenly took on a whole new meaning. Our creativity, our quirkiness, our bonkersness was there for the whole world to see. I mean, funny reading the US tweets, actually, was, I have no idea what's going on in Britain, but I think it's supposed to be quite good, which is, <laughs> I liked it. Now, this sort of leads me on to my own personal story about making that moment and that decision to decide what my legacy is. And what I think I realised about my legacy is I want my legacy to be about liberating other people's legacies. I think there are a lot of people who have 
an idea about what they want to create and what they want to make an impact on. I just don't think they're often very good at letting it go and making it happen. And I thought, well, what if, what if there's a business in that? What if my storytelling career, which has so far sold Bisto and the Olympics and whatever it else it is, what if I could start to sell people's legacies in a meaningful way? Because there are a new group of CEOs who run big global companies who are very, very, very anxious about the legacy their companies are leaving. This is Mutar Kent. He runs Coke. The decisions we make are related to building more sustainable communities and earning our social license to operate. Earning our social license to operate. I think that's an amazing sentence. How the hell is he going to do that without somebody coming and going, right, you need to liberate it. You need to give it over to people to make it happen. You can't own it. The public will own it. Or amazing innovators will own it. But you have got to let it go. How do we do that? This is Peter Brabeck. He, is, he runs Nestle. He's very, very worried about the water issue at the moment. How is he going to liberate that? He's not going to liberate it by holding on to it. He is going to liberate it by allowing innovators into his company, which he's doing, which we're working with at the moment on how you do that. GM, again, another company that's desperate to create legacy and move the game on, but they don't know how to do it, so we have to help them. And Paul Polman, who is a bit of a hero of mine, having told the city that he would not report quarterly, I'm not advocating communism or trying to turn the world into a kibbutz. Some people accuse me of being a socialist, but I'm a capitalist at heart. Why can't we have equitable capitalism as a model? Well, why can't we? I would like it. So I'm going to leave you with something. I'm going to leave you with the anatomy of a 21st century legacy. This is what we do to create legacy these days. To create legacy, there needs to be that moment of liberation. Let it go. Let somebody else take it over and let them form it. For legacies to grow, they need tools to make it easy to get involved. We like being involved. You know, social media has, has proven that. And for legacies to stay relevant, they need easily replicable but modifiable formats. What's right now isn't going to be right tomorrow, isn't going to be right the day after. And for legacies to be adopted by all future generations, they need to change behaviour because what's the point of doing it if we don't change the future? This I'm going to leave you with is my uh, six-year-old um, in the third summer of love, a.k.a. London 2012. Mummy, what does the dis mean in disabled? I'm quite proud of that. I think we might have created a legacy. Thank you.